This is MJ. I'm an author, I'm an artist, I'm an analyzer. You can find all my work at mjmunoz.com. Today we're doing something a little bit special. We're starting something new, and I'm very excited about this. So, I'll start it like this. Welcome to the Fortress of Fiction. As Master of Middle Grade, I am reading an assortment of modern and classic middle grade books. Join me as I test their metal and determine which stories are worthy of building up the Fortress of Fiction and which stories belong in the dungeon. <laughs> so I started off my book, uh, well, I started off this reading list by reading a modern book. I had erroneously stated in my last episode where I was talking about how I can become the master of middle grade by stating that the uh, division was like 90s or so. Uh, this book actually was written in 1975, Tuck Everlasting is the one I'm talking about first, and I'll give you some information, some very neutral information that I had, uh, Claude or Frank help me come up with um, just to give information about the book itself because I have a very negative take on this and I don't want to be I don't want to color my discussion of the book too much uh, by you know coming up with my own description of the book and in, you know in basic information to uh, include about it so I'm just gonna let uh, my well I'm just gonna share with you what the uh, AI came up with so here we go this should be as neutral and PC as you might want it to be. So here we go. Uh, here's some key information about the book Talk Everlasting by Natalie Babbitt. <clears throat> Publication date 1975. Okay, that's a year, not a date. That's all right. Plot summary, 10-year-old Winnie Foster meets the Tuck family who drank from a special spring that stops them from aging. She must decide whether or not to drink from it herself and become immortal like them. Themes, mortality, death, family, coming of age, morality. Writing style, poetic and reflective, told primarily through third-person narration from Winnie's perspective. I disagree with that Winnie's perspective thing, but it is poetic. I was going to say lyrical. Descriptive natural imagery. Okay. Moral content explores complex questions about life, death, and what it means to live a full life rather than romanticizing immortality. Promotes introspection and examining different perspectives. Controversial elements. Some mild violence, including a man hitting his horse... Uh, references to jail and sentencing for, for crimes, but no graphic events. Uh, age recommendation, ages 8 to 12. Newbery Honor Award winner considered appropriate reading for upper elementary school due to accessible writing style and themes. And that's all the neutral boilerplate, I would say, like common uh, perspective on the book. So I'm going to say that this book... <laughs> I would throw it in the dungeon. Um, Natalie Babbitt, I feel badly about saying this. She very well, very well may still be alive today. And like, my goal is not to attack people on this show. Uh, my goal is not to attack or denigrate books or call for them to be banned or anything like that. Although, well, yeah, that's not my goal because I that's not really uh, within my uh, spectrum of values. Um, and that kind of idea makes me uncomfortable because I worry about that sort of thing being abused as it so often is. And so anyway, I'm for things existing and for the market deciding. And if your values align with mine, I would think you'd agree with me about this book. I will go ahead and say things about it that I found objectionable, but I will uh, say the things I found about it that were you know, commendable. So first of all, uh, so I kind of want to get this out of the way. Um, I We'll give you the top reasons I do not like this book and the reason I would throw it in the dungeon, so to speak, which means, like, I will not recommend this to my children. If one of them asks me about it, I will say, yeah, you don't want to read this. Uh, certainly not at their current ages. And I wouldn't really feel comfortable with anybody under, like, 15 reading this. Um, depending on how sheltered they are or how worldly they are, that age is going to, you know, slide. So, um, I'm not saying an ironclad, nobody can read this. You know, I'm an adult, I was able to read it. Uh, it felt very disturbing, and it felt very creepy, and it felt very weird in some places. Uh, again, I, I was going to describe the writing style as lyrical. It's very... It's like, well, except for the weird romance stuff. Like, it's very romantic in that in the way it describes things. Uh, and, like, the, the language is... It's, it's lofty, but it's, it's still accessible. Like, it, it makes nature feel beautiful. It makes the world feel beautiful. And it makes life feel beautiful. Life and uh, death and the change in the cycle. There's a, a, an illustration or a, um, a metaphor about how everything is a wheel. The sun is a wheel. 
uh, the sun is the center of the wheel of well, it says the the sun is the wheel of the cal or that the the sun is the center for, point, the fixed point that the calendar rolls around. But also, um, I thought it was going to go astronomical, but she went with the calendar instead, which is something a little more mundane. But still, astrono- uh, it works astronomically as well. And uh, there's a couple other things, but like a wheel and a cycle, and this you know image is used to relate to several things in the book, and it is interesting, and it's done well, and it, I'm not doing her justice, Bab- I'm not doing Babbitt justice in describing you know how well she wrote the book. Uh, but the reason I say definitely no kid under like you know 15ish, uh, and again depending, uh, is because basically you have a 17 year old boy. He looks like he's 17 years old, but he's actually 107 because of this water of immortality that he and his family were uh, you know drank from uh, 87 years ago, and he basically flirts on and hits on a little girl. And I I forgot to mention this. I was thinking about this earlier. I actually read this book in school. I don't remember the oldest I was because I got kicked out of this school or pulled out because of failing uh, a bunch of classes, uh, which I'm not proud of. It's just a fact. Uh, I was like 12, so I remember it very well. That's why. I was like 12, maybe 11. So like 12 or 11, so a little bit older than the protagonist. One, I did not remember how old she was in this book, but I knew it was weird that the guy was 17 and she was like a kid like me, close to my age, and he was... He basically says, hey, when you get old enough, drink from the water and you can marry me. And we'll just have an adventure and, you know, live life and never have to grow old and all sorts of stuff. Which is a little weird. A little weird. Um, So, and he's only known her for a day. Uh, Like, just thinking more analytically about this. uh, Why wouldn't Tuck find a 17-year-old girl who he likes and tell her, hey... Me and my family, we're special, we're different. By the way, I just need to make a quick amendment. His name isn't Tuck, he's Jesse Tuck. So it's the Tuck family, like Pa Tuck is just called Tuck, then it's May is Ma, and, uh, he, uh yeah, May, that's her actual name. Uh, and then the sons are Jesse, and, oh, the other one. Um, so, anyway, uh, it's just, it's weird because, like, uh, you know, she's a little girl, uh, I don't... Ah, uh, man. I was in school with girls at the time when I read this book, and I knew that girls, and, you know, as a boy, too, around the same age, I understand, like, oh, that person's attractive. Like, that, you know, teenage girl is, you know, really beautiful. Or a girl saying, oh, that teenage boy, he's so, you know, good-looking or whatever. And that's fine, but, like, Jesse Tuck is described as beautiful, and, like, <sighs> little 10-year-old Winifred, like, it, you know, falls in love with him, basically, or at least is infatuated with him. And, like, she considers very much doing this thing, uh, becoming immortal and, you know, living with him uh, forever. And it's just like, I don't know, the way it's it's put forth is really, like, it's really creepy, honestly. And I, I'm not going to let myself get hung up on this, but, like, it just feels kind of gross. And that was the strongest thing I remember. I remember this guy, like, a creeper with a girl, and, like, it's really weird how he, like, wants her to be immortal with him, and, anyway, I was gonna say, it make, it would make a lot more sense if she was, like, 16 or 17, and, like, she had the choice more immediately, and, yeah, why didn't the author just do that? Dang. That's really weird. Anyway, that's, that's just, like, a super odd choice to me, because it makes it so uncomfortable, and it feels so, mm, predatory in a lot of ways, and, uh, that's, that's really not good stuff. Um, so yeah, I would say, like, it's unhealthy, especially for today, in today's day and age. Like, this guy, you know, he's 104, but he's presenting as if he's 17, so it's like, well, you know, I'm 40, but I want to go, well, hmm, and try to keep this as family-friendly as possible. Um, <clears throat> I don't think anything I've said is too too much for a uh, discerning family to listen to. Um, but just, you have people lying and pretending that there's something that they're not, and using that to deceive people and take advantage of them and it almost feels like what Jesse is and how he does things is setting the reader up to be okay with that even though ultimately spoilers 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 Winifred does not take the opportunity to drink from this you know fountain of youth and live forever with the Tuck family or at least Jesse Tuck um she doesn't she chooses not to do that which is good uh, so it's not like the book is telling the readers that's, that that is what they should do. And we're not saying that children won't be, uh, won't face similar 
I don't know, quandaries, temptations, um, you know, big moral decisions in their lives. Like, the older you get, the more important the decisions you make are. But it's just kind of glossed over, and I don't know how useful that is. And going back to this idea of, uh, you know, is this fiction worthy of being a building block in this fortress of fiction? Like, I think fiction should build people up. I think uh, the stories that we tell are... I think storytelling is fundamental to what we are as human beings. There are several, like, I don't know. There's like six good reasons I could give right now, but I won't. Um, It just, I I think that's true. (coughs) I think a lot of uh, work and research and, um, I don't know, philosophizing has been done about this idea. And I agree with... I agree with a lot of what has been said, and I won't make those arguments. I'm not prepared to make those arguments at this time. However, I am prepared to say that because I believe story is so important, um, and that it has such a profound effect on people, that I think we need to be especially careful with the types of stories we tell our children and with how we tell those stories. And I firmly believe that... uh, stories should be written in such a way that they can be enjoyable by all ages and that all ages can take different things away from them and I'm not saying that you can't write, read or enjoy books that are specific to you and your niche but I believe specifically because children are this blank slate uh, to some extent, or at least well anyway, they're this blank, blank slate and they have an ability to be influenced uh, that we should be especially careful with what we might give them uh, to be influenced by and that if a child were to read something like this I would worry what it would do to them now what does it mean that all the kids at my Catholic school read this at a certain age I, I'm not sure you know how did this book influence them again I don't know there's a line in the book in the very beginning actually in like the prologue that basically makes it sound like sometimes when it's summer uh, you're not responsible for your actions because it's just too hot and August is too strong and you're not really um, yeah responsible for your own actions you are compelled to do things you know things happen a certain way and that's not true Um, I mean obviously there are things that are beyond your control however there is a concept um, at least in the world of men now that is this uh, I can't remember if it's utter ownership or ultimate ownership or something about ownership where you just like take total ownership of everything that happens in your sphere of influence and you say this didn't happen because I failed to act or this happened because I made this choice and I think that's a good thing I think that's something powerful and profound and it's a very useful way for men and women and even kids to look at the world so that they have to face the fact that their actions have consequences and I think something in the way that line was written by Babbitt just struck me as oh she's saying that you don't need to be responsible for your actions and then Uh, the story kind of bears that out to some extent, uh, except it also makes arguments to the opposite, that you are responsible for your actions and that your actions do matter and the consequences of your actions are everlasting, uh, much like the Tuck family. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's a really weird, bizarre blend of things, and I don't really understand, like, I don't know what the criterion are for the Newbery Award to be given out, Uh, But I believe I've read a bunch of, or not a bunch, like a good handful of Newbery books in the schools I was in. And I believe, well, I know this is one of them. And I can't remember what others were, but I'm just thinking, how how did this get past a bunch of adults to give to children because of how, like, weird it is and how odd it is? Even if the ways it talks, like, even if the writing is beautiful, which it mostly is, like, I'd say, like, 80% of it's, like, really, you know, written in a really lovely way. The craft of it is good. The, you know, the wordsmithery, if you will, is really entertaining. But, like, the moral implications of things and the, like, lack of, like, full, robust conversation about sensitive topics or, um, <laughs> like, looking at things in a more than a one-sided, simplistic... Ch- like, it presents all these very 
it presents very complex ideas and concepts, but because Winnie is a 10-year-old girl, it gives them to you, like, at her level, and it only deals with them at her level, and it doesn't really deal with them beyond her level, which I think is kind of necessary. And I don't know exactly, other than making different choices and not telling the story this way and, and you know, changing it up, I don't know how else you... I don't know how you make that okay. And I, you know, therefore I wouldn't, you know, write this kind of story at this, you know, at this level or towards this uh, audience because it just seems inappropriate, out of place, a little too much. And, uh, yeah, that's why, uh, I mean, I'm not going to keep this thing in the dungeon forever. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it, it doesn't belong here, I think. I, I, I don't see, I guess I don't see how this would benefit somebody. Um, what do you mean by that? I, I think The Hobbit, reading through The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, will have a lasting, well, not, not even a lasting necessarily, but it will have a positive reaction. It'll, or not a positive, it'll have a positive impact on the reader. It will be inspiring. It will lead them to think about things in a different way and to consider, uh, just to consider how they conduct themselves. This book is not able to do the same thing, I think. I didn't like it as a kid. I was frustrated and confused by it. I thought it was kind of gross then, and it just, it made me feel, like, uneasy now. Um, maybe it's because I'm a father of, of girls, um, and, like, I wouldn't want them being presented by the same situation, even though, like, so, you know, uh, Winnie gets kidnapped in this book, sort of, but not really. I, like, I even hesitate to call it kidnapping. She definitely gets taken by the tux, but it's understandable. And, like, the conversation about how necessary a part of death uh, or a part of life death is, and how it, you know, is part of this cycle in the circle, like, that's a really interesting conversation, but, like, hey, my son is trying to get you to marry him, which the dad didn't know about, uh, like, that's not addressed, so it's like, I don't know, it's just, it's very strange, it's very strange, I, I don't like it, it made me uncomfortable as a kid, and it makes me uncomfortable as an adult with my own kids, and I'm older then, or <laughs> my eldest is uh, older than I was at the time when I read it, and I still think, yeah, I, just, I would not, I would not recommend this book to anybody, uh, really. Um, again, I'm not calling for it to be banned. I'm not calling for it to be um, maligned. I'm not saying it's you know groomer, and you know, I'm, I'm not saying any of those negative things. I'm just saying I don't understand what the point is. I don't understand what the utility is, and I'm shocked that it's so well received. Uh, I even looked on, uh, early on in life, I found uh, resources like Focus on the Families, you know, kids, plugged in online is what it's called, and then there's another offshoot of that, I think, and it's where parents and kids will review all sorts of things and give their perspectives on it, and I was surprised by how many people were positive about this thing, and, um, <laughs> and again, there were a few people who were definitely with me thinking that the whole Jesse and Winnie relationship dynamic was super bizarre um so yeah it, i don't know it's it feels like it's almost written with a childlike naivete which i don't know how old um uh, babbitt was when she wrote this but it's i i wouldn't imagine that she was you know young um and just yeah this is like a never recommend book in my opinion um if anybody asked me about it i would definitely warn them away from it so uh that's about all I have to say. Uh, I don't know if the rest of the uh, of the series will be like this. I, mean, I hope I have a lot more positive interactions with these books than negative interactions, but I'm going to give honest interactions or, or honest reactions to them. And, yeah, <laughs> I can't predict whether or not they'll be positive or negative, but I will be honest, and I will let you know, you know my full thoughts on it. And I would like to know if you like Tuck Everlasting, if you've read it, uh, either... Well, if you've read it and you have thoughts on it that are uh, corresponding to mine or contrary to mine, I would like to hear them and have a conversation about it. You know, what are your thoughts on this thing? And what, I guess, what use, what good is it? And does it need to be a good, does it need to be good, I guess? Because uh, some might argue, oh, it doesn't need to be good, it just needs to be entertaining. It was, it made me so uncomfortable I couldn't be entertained, basically, is is how I felt a lot of the time. So... Like, it almost felt like I shouldn't be reading it. It almost felt wrong in some way. And, uh, yeah, definitely not for this market. If it was, like, a teen book, 
It's like if it was a YA book, I could sort it like to me if it was appropriate for a younger young adult, I would think that would be fine. But it seems to be fairly widely categorized as uh, middle grade, and that just feels wildly inappropriate to me. So I'm done talking about Tech Everlasting for now as far as what I have to say. Uh, I did put out a call for people to give feedback and their thoughts on the book, and I didn't receive anything. So I'm going to put out the call for the next book early, uh, which is right now. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, which I think is the actual title. If not, maybe it's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I don't know. Through the Looking Glass is the second book. I'm only talking about the first book uh, where she goes down the rabbit's hole and... Is it Alex's Adventure? What you no, that's the other one. Anyway, Alice in Wonderland, the first one by Lewis Carroll, where she goes underground and encounters the Queen of Hearts and other things. And uh, I will be talking about that book, and I do invite people's comments, and you can leave those on the blog and anywhere else where you have access to this recording, this episode. And yeah, I'd love to hear from people and have a conversation about these books, because, well, conversations are always better as all as you'll hear me say in a moment or two. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. So I think these book chats are a cool thing to do. I think the fact that these books are so short offers people an opportunity to jump on them and get the audiobooks, which is basically what I'm... I'm going to be preferencing stuff with audiobooks, and if anything... Well, I think... Every, I have a list already, but I'll adjust it as I need to if there are things that don't have audiobooks. So uh, I have a little bit of homework to do on my end to make sure my whole big list has audiobooks so that I don't screw things up because I want to do them in chronological order basically. I'm doing the classic books first like Tuck Everlasting and then uh, or the modern books first like Tuck Everlasting and then the classics which are the old old books like Alice in Wonderland which is from well late 1800s I believe. If I'm wrong I'll correct myself in the notes for it next time but you'll get to hear that in the future so uh, until then adieu. I hope you enjoyed that. Subscribe to keep up with me. Like and share to help me reach more people like you. And go to mjmunoz.com to find your next favorite thing. And don't forget to let your voice be heard. Stories are always better when you're part of the conversation. Until next time, be well. This is MJ, signing out. This has been a Story Over Everything production.